just do it this way. Wow, such a responsive crowd. <laughs> well, well, welcome to the closing plenary of this year's Natural Areas Association annual conference. I'm Greg Applett. I'm a science director at the Wilderness Society just down the street in Denver. Um, I was part of last year's uh, closing plenary and I'm back here this year to, to moderate. Um, those of you who were in attendance last year may remember the, the uh, session that we had that was focused on restoration in the Anthropocene in an era of change. We had a rousing uh, discussion throughout that process uh, over the relative merits of traditional restoration versus uh, interventions that are aimed at kind of facilitating change into novel conditions that are hopefully more resilient to change in the future. Um, even had a spirited discussion of, of uh, the merits of traditional reserve-based management as well. And um, there was a lot of uh, disagreement, a lot of uh, differences of opinion expressed throughout the process, but one thing that every, every speaker agreed on and came, came out during the ensuing discussion was that we have to start managing landscapes or at least thinking about our, the natural areas that we, that we manage within a landscape context. We have to start thinking about managing whole landscapes for connectivity, for resilience, for uh, species viability. And um, while there was tremendous agreement on that principle, we got the sense, it was clear from some of the comments made in the, in the discussion afterwards, that there was a lot of kind of anxiety over how managers of small reserves or natural areas can, can contribute to conservation at a larger scale. If you're just managing a relatively small county open space, how do you contribute to conservation at a landscape scale? And so this year, we thought we would follow on last year's closing plenary with a session that describes how that can be done so that everybody leaves here fired up and ready to contribute. So we crafted a, a set of panelists here that are going to walk us through a set of examples of how that can be done. We're going to start with Scott Black of the Xerces Society, the world's leading organization focused on, on invertebrate conservation, who's going to talk about how natural areas can contribute to the conservation of a species or species population at a landscape scale. And then we're going to move to a, to a presentation by Heather Knight, who spent her career with the Nature Conservancy building connectivity across the landscape right here in Larimer County that connected the mountains to the prairies. She's gonna talk about how collaboration can be an important factor in building a connected landscape at a sort of county scale. And then we're gonna to go to, to Reed Noss, who is no doubt familiar to most of you, uh, recently uh, retired from the University of Central Florida, now associated with the School of the Environment at Duke who's going to talk about the successes and remaining challenges associated with trying to do that at an even larger scale, at the scale of the state of Florida. So by the time we're done, I think we'll have a good sense of how natural areas can contribute to large scale conservation. I'm looking forward to seeing what everybody says. Uh, when we're, so we're, we're not going to take questions between speakers. We're going to hold those. Uh, leave them for the discussion at the end. We want to have, we want to maximize the time that we have at the end. Uh, in thinking about your question, think about making it short, sweet, crisp, um, and uh, and we'll we'll try to entertain as many questions with the uh, with our speakers as possible. All right. So without further ado, here's Scott Black. Thanks so much for having me here today. Um, I always like to do my thank yous first before I get started because I tend to uh, finish up and have to rush. And, and you should never rush to do thank yous. Uh, so first, 
I want to thank the Natural Areas Association and Lisa for inviting me and all of you for attending. I was just talking to someone uh, today about how this conference I really like because it's really about the doers, the people who are actually on the ground getting stuff done. I love science, but after you're pummeled for three days with just science and no real solutions, um, it gets a little daunting. So thank you all and thank the Natural Areas Association for this. Also thank my co-authors, uh, Rich Hatfield and Serena Jepson. They, uh, Serena came on 10 years ago and Rich seven years ago and really helped me formalize a lot of the work we were doing on Martin Skipper. Now I'm gonna see if I can make that work. I also wanna thank my wife and kids. Uh, I travel a lot and uh, they inspire and empower me to do my work and they'll even get geeky with me this was before the full eclipse, it had just started. So it's a, what an event, and what an event for kids to be able to see. It, it was, is almost a once in a lifetime event. Like to thank my staff. When I came to Xerces, we had four people. And now we've just hit over 50 and we'll be hiring more next year. So watch that young people who are at the conference for uh, job announcements. And these are the people out working with managers, land managers, farmers, and others, really getting in their hands dirty and getting conservation done on the ground. I'd also like to thank our members. We've got 11,000 of them. We've got hundreds of scientists, dozens of federal agencies, hundreds and hundreds of farmers, over 50 companies, dozens of private foundations and thousands and thousands of citizen scientists and others who are taking action to basically help us do this, to protect tens of thousands of acres for some of the smallest animals on the planet. We're talking small areas sometimes for these small animals and supported a half a million acres of restoration uh, across farmland and, and other wildlands. And small acreages add up. So that's my first point. I work in this world where small acreages really add up to conservation for insects. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about this butterfly. Uh, that is a beautiful butterfly. It's a less than an inch long or about an inch long, um, but it's beautiful. And I'm gonna to talk to you about an unprecedented conservation effort to save this butterfly, really, um, and to conserve this butterfly and to recover this butterfly. It all started in 2000 when uh, the butterfly was listed as a candidate under the Endangered Species Act. And some of you may realize that when something is a candidate under the Endangered Species Act, all of a sudden people stand up and go, ooh, we better do something. I'd been talking about this species for a while uh, before that happened, but once it happened, we were able to harness an incredible partnership of many people to try to actually conserve the butterfly. So many, many partners, the Forest Service, BLM, Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management Interagency Special Status Sensitive Species Program, say that three times fast, um, has been an integral part of this. They are uh, in Oregon, Washington, working with the BLM and Forest Service and were really a key partner. But all of these partners were key in certain places in the landscape. So the Martin Skipper is found in the Pacific Northwest, uh, only in the Pacific Northwest, but it's got a really interesting disjunct geography. We've got populations, few still imperiled populations in the Puget Trough, more populations in the southern Washington Cascades, good populations in uh, the southern uh, Oregon Cascades, and then some scattered populations on the coast in southern Oregon and northern California. Um, and, and I find this uh, geography really interesting and daunting. When we started to think about conservation, we had both private landowners as well as seven different agencies with this, man, with this animal on their lands. And we had to figure out how to work with all of them. And when we started, we really didn't have a lot of information. We, relatively little was known. Um, we did know that there were some populations. We knew that some populations had been lost. And, and that the populations we had were quite small. But we really didn't have data on many sites and there'd never been a search effort. And that was really the first thing that the partnership did is we wanted to understand the true status of this butterfly. So we set out really to, um, to with a search effort and to develop a search image and comprehensively search radiating out from the known populations. 
not a bad job if you're looking at these folks out there doing that. Um, I used to do this for a living, now I manage a conservation organization, but that's all good. And uh, this was really good because we really started to figure out what was going on with this butterfly. Uh, in, in 1999, we had 14 known sites. By today, we have 165 known sites. All the new sites, though, were found in the regions around where the original sites were. We were not able to really close any of those gaps between, uh, between these metapopulations that we have in Washington and Oregon and California. But the majority of the sites we found were really small, and the majority of the sites we found, as I'll talk about, had a lot of threats and a lot of problems. We also didn't have a full grasp of the butterfly's life history. Martin skippers are grass-feeding butterflies. They feed exclusively on grasses. I guess that makes sense. Um, but most people believed that, uh, that they fed almost exclusively on fescue. And me, being a dunderhead, I'm out there searching, and I'm finding Martin skippers, but not finding fescue. And I'm not a botanist, so I would take all, take 20 different grasses in. Am I missing something here? And they're like, no, that's, there's no fescue. So, so we set out with Washington State University to study what this butterfly was actually doing. What is it eating? And we worked with incredible young graduate students. This is Lonnie Beyer here, who worked for Xerces, but also did her master's at Washington State University. And Lonnie was, you know, conservation is often about people. And Lonnie was amazing, because Martin Skipper doesn't land to lay its eggs. It hovers about six or eight or 12 inches above the ground and drops the eggs. And Lonnie figured out how to watch these with binoculars. As they dropped their eggs, she'd run up and put a stake, put a flag, and she'd follow them across the meadow, putting flags. And then she was able to come back and find an egg. This is the larva. This is a second instar larva and how small that is. She was able to find the egg. And then she was often able to, weeks later, to come back and find the larva. I tried to do this, and I'm glad they would have never hired me, actually. Um, I would not be in conservation had this been my first job. But she really did find that this had a much, her and other graduate students, found that this uh, had a much broader host range. Fescue was one of them, Danthonia, Carex. And really interesting, it has fidelity at one site, where it might just use fescue, but down the road, it might be using Carex. And that's where it has fidelity, so really interesting. Another thing is that Martins also avoid shade. That's another finding that was really important because this is what's happened to most of the meadows where Martin lives in the Cascades. Uh, the picture on your left is 1953. The picture on your right is 2011. And those are study sites that I work at, Short Creek 1 and Short Creek 2 with Martin Skipper. And you can see it used to have an open meadow structure, and now it's got these, these little tiny meadows. So of course, fire is an important tool in forest management. But butterfly people are skeptical about fire, because in the east, we have found that some butterflies respond well to fire, and some don't. So we needed to figure out whether fire could be a, a good tool for Martin. And an opportunity arose when we were doing searches in Northern California and found the largest population by far in California. And we found that population the summer after a fire plan had already been done for the entire area. So I approached the burn folks at the Six Rivers National Forest and a little uh, tentatively, because they'd already figured out this whole burn plan, and I came to them and said, dudes, you've got a rare, well, no, I shouldn't say dudes, because many of them were women, um, you've got a, a, a rare butterfly, and I'm a little, one, worried about burning this whole thing, and two, this could be a great opportunity for a study. And really cool, they immediately stepped up and said, yes, let's do a study. And we were able to mark areas to burn and not burn directly in the middle of the Martin, different Martin habitats. And then go back for four out of five years to do transects uh, in burned and unburned areas. And what we found really uh, did give us pause for using fire for this particular butterfly. And sometimes you have to know the animal you're working with. Um, 
as you can see in purple, those are the areas that are not burned, and in the other color are areas that were burned. And after four years, or five years, four years of monitoring, this butterfly had not recolonized or bounced back in those burned sites. So using fire was going to be a little difficult for Martin Skipper. We also, as we were doing all of this study, we were documenting threats at all of these sites. And working with ISP, who funded management plans, we were able to put together management guidance and management plans for the vast majority of sites on the landscape. And the thing about the initial management plans is a lot of this wasn't rocket science. As Rick Knight will tell you, off-road vehicles can cause damage. Um, I say that because I talk to Rick a lot as I went to school here, and I would go over and bother Rick um, in his office because I was working on minimizing uh, off-road vehicles in the Arapahoe Roosevelt National Forest. So Rick was an incredible sounding board for that, so sorry to put you on the spot there, Rick. Um, but he helped me back in the day. But in these meadows, these are wet meadows, they're a favorite of off-road vehiclers, and it's pretty simple to keep them out, though. By hardscaping with fences, it doesn't exclude them totally, but it, it really has minimized the amount of off-road vehicles in, in these sites. As we know, shrub and tree encroachment is, is also an issue. I like to use this because this is the only time I've ever been out with folks that are wearing hard hats and carrying butterfly nets. <laughs> um, and so I just love this picture. Um, so we, uh, Forest Service, it was a, a project area, and so they had to wear their, wear their hard hats. Um, so we went in and developed um, plans to remove the small trees from uh, immediately in the meadow and then out into the larger, larger trees to try to uh, uh, expand the footprint of the open meadows for the Martin Skipper. Remember, they don't like shade. Overgrazing was also an issue at, at many Martin sites, and I don't say grazing, I say overgrazing. The issue is that Martin skipper like wet meadows, and they like those grasses, and cows like wet meadows and like those grasses. And the only way it's going to work with cows and Martin is if they can be moved around. And unfortunately, what we found is that they couldn't be moved around um, because of the way the allotment plans were written and things like that. So we came up with plans to basically fence off the core area of the Marden with, uh, and this is a really interesting one, the reason it's that U shape is the, in the middle is a, is a pond where the cows go to drink. So we had to put it in that U shape. But these are drop fences that can be dropped every fall so that uh, elk and other animals can get in. And we do know from a site that uh, doesn't have fencing because we didn't actually um, want it there, um, cows come in in October, and that is one of the best sites we have. So if we can get grazing late in the season for Marden, it seems to be beneficial. But we weren't able to do that with, through the current allotment plans. And then I would say the key to this was outreach. We tried to inspire and empower with technical assistance uh, the land managers who were actually doing this work. Get them excited about the conservation. And, um, you know, it, it's really cool when, you know, guys who did their masters or uh, working on elk or deer, and the next thing you know, I show up and they're showing me their new butterfly net. And they're so excited about it, and they bought this cool butterfly net and showing me all the butterflies that they're finding. I'm changing some minds here, and this is a, a really, really good thing. Um, so all that work did lead to the Forest Service not listing the species. They cited this as the main reason. We had already done much of the work that would have been done had a listing taken place. And so we really did agree uh, that the species should no longer be listed. But when that happens, when you no longer have that threat of listing, there is the potential for money to dry up, for enthusiasm to dry up, and we're working against that. We, we do have really, really good partners, and the people who have been engaged since the start are really engaged, but we're gonna need to re-engage the new people as they come on, because this is no longer a threatened, endangered species. So we have designed monitoring, and we're implementing a stratified monitoring approach in each of the regions, so we can track the long-term 
uh, trends of this, this butterfly so that we can be ready if it starts to head downhill again. Um, but there's still other work to do. Uh, there's more work to do with thinning and reconnecting these meadows because these were likely real meta populations in the past and often they're now isolated sites. And that I think is going to be a real problem for, for this butterfly. And then we need to ensure that the sites are still managed so that the worst abuses of off-road vehicles or overgrazing uh, or conifer encroachment don't uh, again uh, rear their heads. Um, we also need to be thinking into the future and about climate change. Uh, unfortunately, two Marden sites, two pretty important Marden sites burned this year. And we had an incredible fire season in Oregon this year. And um, one I also want to say is I'm, I'm really thinking about those people in California. Um, the, the, the fire season in the West is, has been incredible. I've never seen anything like it. But just a few weeks ago, two sites burned. And we really need to make sure we're managing this complex of sites. So if two sites burn, it's not the end of the world and it's not the end of the Martin Skipper. So some final thoughts. I think we've, we've really had an initial conservation success. We've bit, brought a partnership together, we communicated, we provided technical assistance, and we really have done good, good conservation. And there's more to do, and there's always going to be more to do. But we've made a really, really good start, and I think made the future for this butterfly much more bright. And the neat thing about this is that these areas are magical. These are the best areas you could ever think to work. Um, you, if, you, if you work on butterflies, you go, you camp, you wake up, you have coffee, you have a little more coffee, maybe read a little bit, 10 o'clock, because you got to wait till 10 o'clock, the butterflies have to be up, you, you go and do your work until 5, then you go make camp, you open your beer, you hang out. It is magical to be a <laughs> butterfly, to work on butterflies. Um, but these sites, these sites are some of the most beautiful sites and they're, they're important for a whole array of other invertebrates and vertebrates like, like sandhill cranes, as well as for recreation and, and for hunting. So the Marden really, it was not just about the Marden, although that's what we used. We've really improved these sites uh, for a lot of other animals, including um, the, the western bumblebee, which is a rare and is now uh, petitioned for listing, uh, and, and this is a species that is, is co-occurs at some of the sites. So my take-home message, though, is that uh, in my one minute left that I know, is that we, we love science. I'm a science geek. But Science is not enough. We have to understand how to manage these, these species, but we have to go out and we have to coordinate on, a, on, a, on this. We had to coordinate with multiple agencies, many, many people, and we had to provide them the information they need through different communication mechanisms for this to be success. And, and I think that's what we need to think about with conservation is science, communication, and coordination. And if we think those three thoughts, we're going to go a long way in this world, even under some of the um, unspoken things that are happening in, in society today. So with that, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. see my slide here, but I don't see it up here yet. So. There. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for the privilege to be here with all of you this afternoon. Um, what a great organization. There's a lot of people to thank here, um, both from natural areas, but also from all of the folks who've contributed to that Laramie Foothills work over the years. And I know many of you have heard a lot about the project um, through the session today. 
and will be going out into the field. So I won't list all of those people, but um, there are many, many people who've made this possible. So it's a privilege to share it, more about it with all of you. Um, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Uh, this is a great uh, life lesson that I've taken to heart and want to put it in context of the work that we've done in the Laramie Foothills. So for almost 25 years, I had the privilege to work in this watershed along the Colorado-Wyoming border. Um, I started as an assistant preserve manager seven months a year, and by the time we were done and I was ready to pass it off onto the next generation, we'd been working across this 400,000 acre landscape across public and private boundaries with all kinds of people that we would have never imagined at the beginning. It's located about 30 miles north of Fort Collins and you've driven up from Denver so you know what the Front Range looks like today. But this is a place that still has these great representations of grasslands, foothill shrublands and our forested systems punctuated by streams and wetlands and riparian systems, much of which you would have seen across the whole Front Range in the past. In 1987, the Nature Conservancy purchased a property called Phantom Canyon Preserve in this watershed and opened it to the public in 1989, and that really began um, their role in this landscape um, that led to a collaboration over those years. Um, many of these are John Fielder photos, so much thanks to him. Um, <coughs> So the preserve is one of the last remaining roadless river canyons on the Front Range and sits right in the transition zone between the grasslands, the foothills, and the, the ponderosa pine system. Um, it has uh, its home to over 600 plant species, but also supports wide-ranging species, elk, mountain lion, mule deer, etc. Also, some of the smaller live little things, uh, here Preble's meadow jumping mouse, the first listed subspecies of a mammal in the state of Colorado, and we have the greatest potential habitat for it in our watershed, and also over 200 species of birds. So it's a, a place of great richness and wonderful biological heritage. But as Jason LaBelle talked about this morning, it's a place that's had a long human history as well. You heard from Jason about Paleo-Indians dating back to 12, 11,000 years, and later Native Americans who came to this landscape, many different groups of people. By the 1880s, Anglos came into the area, uh, first mining and trapping, and then um, agriculture came, uh, ranching and farming, mostly ranching. And today, ranching continues and is probably the most sustainable and most compatible of land uses in this watershed with our natural resources. But in the early 1990s, there was a large change, um, like in many places in the American West, and Colorado was often the top third fastest growing state in the nation. These changes happened rapidly, um, people moving out into once open spaces um, the rate of change was massive, and it, it created both ecological, social, and cultural impacts. <coughs> so that's some context for you. And now what I want to do is focus on three major questions that we asked during this time and, and lessons that I think we, we experienced, many of which I hope you'll be able to relate to. So one of our first questions was, how could we expand the effect of one preserve across this landscape but minimize at the same time the economic and social costs, not only to our organization but to the community at large? Again, here's that map. So here's this 400,000 acre watershed and not to scale and probably <coughs> still too big on this map was this single preserve, 1,120 acres, purchased by the Nature Conservancy. Um, luckily, it sits right in the heart, more or less, of the watershed. Um, but however, it's got a lot of edge. It's skinny, but it has great biological diversity. But that alone would not, in any way, 
um, save or protect or conserve all of the species and the livelihoods in this landscape. So it's incumbent on us to think about, you know, what's beyond these boundaries? And how do we think about that? Who are these other people? What are these other places? So as we started to, <coughs> excuse me, understand the natural and human history of this place, we really relied upon other people in this landscape, um, meeting with them, talking with them, walking across the landscape. And what we discovered very quickly was that um, we were trying to do the same kinds of management across our boundaries. So when the Nature Conservancy purchased this, like most of us, we put up our fence, we put up our signs, and then we started learning about the place and started thinking about stewardship and how to implement things and what were the priorities. Very quickly, we realized that um, neighbors were kind to us and they let us know that that electric fence, even though it really blended in visually well, it really didn't work functionally very well. Um, we also unknowingly cut off water to um, the rancher who was trying to graze that land. And we had, we had originally eliminated grazing, um, but then we're trying to put it back because we understood it was an important disturbance. Thank you, Susan. <clears throat> so one of, the, one of the biggest things we did that was symbolic, I think, for us um, and indicated that we really got to know our neighbors was to remove five miles of three-strand high tensile electric fence. And if you've ever built fence, it's easier to build and much harder to remove. And so we had volunteers who spent years rolling this up, pulling it out, because this is the flattest part. It goes up and down canyons and through shrublands. And we didn't know at the time that what that would do is it would lead to a trade on our part to the rancher on the neighboring property and they would take that fence and improve the grazing management on their home ranch. And then consequently did six conservation easements over the following years. And then the owner of the property right next door also did the next conservation easement. So that began this building of a corridor across this landscape. One property, one neighbor, one partnership at a time. If I showed you this map in 1973 or so, it would have four colors. The um, upper elevation green of the Roosevelt National Forest, the blue, darker blue state wildlife areas and state land, uh, CSU Maxwell Ranch, and then the lighter blue, the state trust lands and land board lands. The rest would have been gray, unprotected private lands. And because of this amazing partnership and um, people in the community realizing that there was a threat of fragmentation and loss of their livelihoods and the natural heritage, they came together and um, added significant um, conservation. So the public lands prior to um, our work totaled 110,000 acres out of the 400,000. All those lime greens are conservation easements held by a variety of land trusts and organizations and then the browns and tans are new open spaces. So collectively, this group added 100,000 acres um, of private and new public protected lands. So lessons from this, I would say, you really need to be willing to reach across boundaries, not just physical ones like our fence, but political and social ones. And think about the whole of that watershed, not just its small sum parts and how they're interconnected. And it was by asking questions that were really heartfelt and listening to those people and seeing challenges, not as barriers, but as opportunities. How do we turn that around and solve that? And that's when we saw collaboration and innovation emerge. But there was always this piece, if you're gonna start something, you better follow through. The second question that we asked was, what's our biggest challenge to achieving um, our conservation outcomes? In 2002, this wonderful text, uh, co-authored by Rick and others, um, came out and we were lucky to be asked to write a case study for it. Um, <coughs> here's the title of my case study. <coughs> 
it's all about money. Yeah, that's all it would take. You have to remember that when we started this work, this was an explosion in population growth, the land rush from urban areas out into, into farms and ranches and other open spaces. We were losing the size of Rocky Mountain National Park on an annual basis. We were converting that landscape um, to ex-urban development and commercial use. This is a huge change. And it was also at a time of the, the uh, peaks of environmentalism. People were fearful about government, about new things. The Nature Conservancy was the nature conspiracy, and conservation easements were brand new tools. And I kept thinking, you know, if we just had more money, we could do this stuff because the rate of change was rapid. But what I learned was, yeah, money is important, funding is important. But I realized that we had other resources that were just as important. And places like Phantom Canyon Preserve were places to bring people, to have local people tell stories around campfires to their new neighbors, to have children in the elementary schools go out onto public and private land and understand about watersheds and meet the irrigation company, meet ranchers. It was about volunteers coming out and giving back to a place, sweat equity, building things, pulling weeds. It was about collecting information that would help us do better management. So what this did is it enabled us to have credible people delivering important messages, connecting people to a place. It built a story. Why was this place special? Why should anybody care about it? And what should we do together? It was about the people. It was about listening to each other. And it was about figuring out that we had this common love of this place. And if we didn't act together in some meaningful way, we might lose that. So instead of money, money's important, don't count me wrong there, but it was about the people. If the people didn't care, if we didn't listen, if they weren't heard, if we couldn't hear their stories and they ours, we wouldn't have these relationships that we could then trust each other to do this work. So it was about starting small and scaling up and celebrating success. Beer is always helpful. But it's about also giving away the credit for this. Just give it away whenever you can. Just give it away. It doesn't matter who was the key or when or where or how. It's that it got done. So the last question um, and lessons that I wanted to share was, what's the biggest barrier, the biggest barrier that we could remove that would enable others to be willing to innovate, to adopt new things, to try new things. What, what could we do um, to help you know, move people toward other ideas, other things, as we learned in this place? It really helped us to think about the ecological processes that maintain this landscape, to think about the historic condition, what had changed, and so what was the current condition today, and where do we want to go in the future? And what if these ecological um, processes were in place or were partly altered or things that needed to be restored back? So understanding that first was important. But then it was about, so where do you start that work? So we chose um, the third biggest threat in the landscape in this, in this case, invasive plant species. Everybody had them, everybody hated them, and nobody had enough capacity to do anything about it. So it's a place that we all could come together and say, we need to do something here. We didn't choose to start at the hardest, most tricky, most controversial spot. We chose to start where we could all do something together. And then over time, we moved to the more tricky things. Fire played a, a major role across this landscape. Um, there was a lot of evidence for it. We had a lot of partners. Um, it was a little scary. To, to try to do this. It takes technically competent people. It takes some significant trust. Most people, the only fire they've ever known is something that is fearful and results in loss, significant loss, both to landscapes and people themselves. 
So we started really small and we had this great partnership with the county, um, the local fire department, the fire service. Our leader was a person of extreme credibility, um, Paul Gleason. And that enabled us to do the first couple of prescribed fires on just a couple of acres. One was a training burn um, on the rim of the canyon and the other was um, a place that had been invaded by cheatgrass. And we chose the locations carefully. It wasn't about size, it was about the ability to demonstrate this because we needed to build trust, we needed to be safe, but we also needed people to see it. So it was right in places where everybody who came to the preserve would see it. And we also had people to interpret and have neighbors present so they could watch the whole process and do the pre and post monitoring. Um, oh, sorry, there was another, let me see. Oh, there's an image that's disappeared, sorry. You would have seen our fire use module. So now the Colorado chapter of the Nature Conservancy has a fire use ma module and these are folks that are certified to not only do prescribed fire and manage fire but suppression fire. And it's exciting to say today that they probably do more work off Nature Conservancy properties on, on many other um, private and public lands and have really brought the scale of that work to a significant level and those are all ecologically based um, fires. So what's the take home message? What was that biggest barrier we could remove? It was all about risk. It was about fear of failure. It was about risk to people and life. What if you made an incorrect choice about your management strategy? So we, we realized it was about taking calculated risk, having contingency plans, and also approaching it from let's learn about this together, let's think about it as an experiment, let's, let's you know, whatever is successful, let's build on it and share it. And when we see failure, let's also talk about it, but let's not repeat it, if we can. So a final couple of thoughts for you. So these, of course, come from my experience over those years and every place is unique. But I think there are some things that are in common uh, across almost anywhere we might work in the world. And of course, you need to know your place first, the human and natural history and how that system works, right? That's our grounding. But then it's about the people. It's about the relationships. It's about a common place to work from. It's about celebrating what works. It's about learning from your challenges. It's about figuring out how to come together and take some risk, but then build on that and scale up from there. I realize this takes time, and sometimes it costs more as well. But for me and our experience in the Laramie Foothills, I think the, the lasting result is more durable and hopefully will go beyond any of our work here. So I guess I would say to you, I guess we all have to decide for ourselves. Are we going to go fast and go alone? Or are we going to go far and go together? Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks first to Lisa Smith for inviting me um, once again to a Natria's uh, conference. I've been coming to these fairly regularly since 1981, I think when I first joined the association. Uh, definitely one of my favorites. So today I'm going to talk about, well, I'm gonna use Florida as, as a case study and something of a personal story of why it's important to protect both small natural areas as well as large semi-natural landscapes. And so these are my main points, and I promise this is my only bullet slide of the entire talk. <laughs> and in fact, these, these take-home lessons um, basically are, are all you really need to know. The following slides are really just serve to embellish uh, these lessons. Uh, first, I've already said, uh, both small and large, natural and semi-natural areas are important if we want to conserve biodiversity. They serve different purposes. Um, especially in uh, the East, 
Um, relatively pristine or high quality natural areas are usually small. They're often um, isolated, but they're absolutely critical for protecting rare species and rare natural community types. Large areas, landscapes on the other hand, are typically semi-natural, but they are critical in different ways. For example, for conserving populations of wide-ranging species and sustaining ecological processes or function. These strategies are complementary, not mutually exclusive. So whenever possible, we have to pursue both if we can. Now, as a prelude to my Florida story, I have to talk just a little bit about Ohio because my experiences in Ohio shaped what I want, went on to, um, to do and, uh, with my colleagues in Florida. Um, I cut my teeth in the natural race field in Ohio, uh, starting in the early 70s when I worked as a volunteer naturalist for the Ohio Historical Society, which, which at the time managed this area, where probably some of you have been because we had a Natural Race Association field trip here um, a few years ago, Cedar Bog State Nature Preserve. Um, and after that, um, I worked a variety of jobs. I got a master's degree, and I, and I went on to work for the Ohio Heritage Program. And um, among other things, I was involved in setting up monitoring plots within Ohio State Nature Preserves. And having gone to graduate school and learned about island biogeographic theory and the problems of habitat fragmentation, uh, I began to get very concerned that um, Ohio's nature preserves, like in many states, especially in the east, were mostly small, isolated areas. And I was worried that these were not complete ecosystems. I was worried that they would not be able to maintain themselves as natural areas in the long term. They would suffer from edge effects, that they would lose species. So my boss at the time was uh, Bob McCants, um, whom many of you know, and Bob gave me a very interesting assignment. He said, Reed, what are we missing in natural areas conservation in Ohio? What can we do better? What can we do that's new and would complement what we've been doing already? So I apologize for this math. This is the only one I have of this little plan. But I went back. I said, well, you know, we're not maintaining entire ecosystems. So I propose that we recreate an Ohio Valley wilderness. We restore the great mixed mesophytic forest, the most species-rich deciduous forest in North America, and um, bring back populations of the wide-ranging species, beginning with fairly easy ones like otter and bobcat, moving up to black bear and perhaps beyond. Now, Bob McCants liked my um, plan, but it did not go over at all well with the higher levels of the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, who thought I'd wasted a lot of salary time coming up with this preposterous plan. So I ultimately was laughed out of Ohio. I quit my job um, and went to Florida. But in the meantime, the Nature Conservancy, um, Ohio's office, took an interest in this plan, especially in the landscape that I identified as the highest priority to start to connect preserves, bring them together, and beyond. And this was the Nature Conservancy in Cincinnati Museum's Edge of Appalachia Preserve System. And so when I proposed this grand scheme, uh, the Edge of Appalachia System was just a, a collection of small, isolated preserves. Over the years, they have been brought together and connected, as I suggested, eastward to the Shawnee State Forest. And thanks to um, the Nature Conservancy people there, Chris, Chris Beadle in particular, for sending me updates of their progress. 13,000 acres so far and still growing. And so I was in uh, Florida. I was working for the Florida Natural Areas Inventory and, and looking for a PhD advisor. And I found Dr. Larry Harris, professor at the University of Florida. And to my amazement, Larry had been working on very similar things as I was doing in Ohio. And he was proposing landscape linkages between large natural or semi-natural landscapes across the state of Florida. Um, the most famous one is an area called the Pinhook Swamp, which um, Larry's proposal to protect this, which would connect the Okefenokee and the Osceola, was very controversial also because the Pinhook Swamp was mostly logged over private timberland. But eventually, Larry's arguments started to get, to get some some um, say at various uh, venues, and the Nature Conservancy began buying land, and today we have a largely intact corridor between Okefenokee and Osceola to the benefit of the Florida black bear and other species that require these compromised but otherwise very important connections. 
And so what's happened over so much of um, our landscapes of the world and really is the impetus for these large landscape designs in many cases is that populations of wide-ranging species have become fragmented. So the Florida black bear, for instance, originally occurred throughout the state of Florida, except for the most extensive treeless landscapes like the Everglades, Everglades proper. Um, today it's limited to these um, fragmented patches like you see here. So the idea of the connectivity is to try to bring these together so we can have a long-term viable population or metapopulation. So eventually, actually against Larry Harris's advice, because he was worried about backlash, I came, I came up with this proposal for a statewide network, which um, I first published this actually besides, besides in the Earth First Journal. <laughs> I first published it in the Naturaries Journal uh, back in 1987. But, um, it was perceived at the time as a little bit, kind of like my Florida proposal and Larry Harris's Pinnock Swamp, as something totally unrealistic, not doable. But to my surprise, to everyone's surprise perhaps, within a few years, the state agencies and the Nature Conservancy had refined this proposal and were already using it to prioritize lands for acquisition by the state of Florida. And so this ultimately became the Florida Ecological Greenways Network. Now this network isn't all in place now. It's back, only those dark green are existing conservation lands. The rest is simply a proposal which is prioritized there from P1 through P5. But in any case, um, this until quite recently did a lot of good to help protect land in Florida. And Florida spent more money, over $300 million annually, protecting land than probably anywhere in the world. And it worked, at least in, in terms of its intended purposes. Um, this is um, an example. A Florida panther was radio collared down in the um, Big Cypress. And if you can follow the little lines with arrows, it found its way northward. It spent almost a year in the Nature Conservancy's Disney Wilderness Preserve, which is not far from Disney World. It couldn't find a mate, so it headed back home. And eventually, its, its batteries uh, went dead on its collar um, near where it came from. The latest vision for a connected Florida landscape is called the Florida Wildlife Corridor. And it, um, this slide kind of suggests it's maybe ended, but it started in 2012 and it's ongoing, but this is a 2017 version of the map. And this is essentially a simplified version of the Florida Ecological Greenways Network. Unfortunately, it leaves out a lot. And over the years, I started to get increasingly nervous and frankly feeling increasingly guilty about these large landscape plans because they were leaving out so much. And though I have yet to quantify this, I know for a fact that the vast majority of locations of narrow endemic species and natural communities are totally missing from this Florida Wildlife Corridor. And I think that's a problem. It's the problem especially because almost all of the environmental groups in Florida have put completion of the Florida Wildlife Corridor as their highest priority. So what are we missing? Well, Florida has a lot of endemics, and a lot of them, as I mentioned, occur outside this corridor. For example, in coastal locations. This is one of my favorites. Um, it occurs in just three counties, as you see here. Uh, it occurs often on old Indian shell middens that were built up by pre-Columbian Indian groups in Florida, um, it would not be protected by these large landscape schemes. This is just one example. There's many others. If we look at our springs, our caves, other subterranean systems, these for the most part are also outside the Florida Wildlife Corridor. So we have species such as the, um, I guess the, the uh, pointer doesn't work, but we have that spring run spider lily, which is not highly endangered, but it's a southeastern endemic only occurs in springs, and when we have some very um, highly endemic taxa like the Orlando spider cave crayfish known from one site, the Georgia blind salamander known from very few sites on the Georgia-Florida uh, border. These would be missed by these large-scale landscape conservation plans. Any place that has very high endemism requires a multifaceted strategy. It can't rely on something as simplistic as a Florida wildlife corridor, or anything along those lines, including my early maps. They would not have cut it. Um, this is a map showing the ranges overlaid of narrow range species endemics in the southeast. And these are defined in this particular study by Estelle and Cruzan as species 
that are confined to 25 or fewer counties over their range. And you can see the concentration of endemics in Florida. And if we look closely just at Florida, we can see precisely where those hot spots are. Um, the Panhandle, the central spine of the state, particularly the Lake of Wales Ridge, the southern part, and perhaps surprisingly coastal areas. Surprising because of the many sea level fluctuations we've had in Florida. Um, the Atlantic Coastal Ridge, um, to a lesser extent along the Gulf Coast, the Miami Rock Ridge and the Florida Keys. That's where most of our narrow endemic taxa are found. We've done a pretty good job of protecting land, as I alluded to earlier in Florida. We spent a lot of money for over three decades in protecting land. Because of this, we have 10 and a half million acres of conservation land, some 30% of the state of Florida. Now, I hasten to add, these are not all strict protected areas. These include multiple use lands, such as state forests, national forests, and military installations. However, these multiple use semi-natural landscapes are doing a pretty good job of protecting biodiversity if we can keep them managed well. And that's really the key caveat. Uh, this is an example of a military land. This is Avon Park Air Force Range down in south central Florida along the Kissimmee River. Um, these lands are not all semi-natural habitats. This is a beautiful miles-long seepage slope complex with a number of endemic species. It's like that yellow flower you see there is a endemic to central Florida, Polygala rugoei. And right across the river from Avon Park, we have one of um, Florida's largest state-managed areas, Kissimmee Prairie Preserve State Park, nearly 60,000 acres, the largest expanse of uh, subtropical hyper-seasonal grassland, better known as Florida Dry Prairie, which is something of a misnomer because it's seasonally inundated. But is this enough? We have all this conservation land, yet species such as our only full endemic species of bird, the Florida scrub jay, are declining increasingly precipitously because a lot of their land is outside existing conservation areas. So our governor and legislature say that we already have too much conservation land. So our land acquisition has essentially stopped. Um, I and almost every biologist I know in the state of Florida say that because of the problems we're experiencing and the many unprotected populations of endemic taxa and so on, we need a lot more protected area. And this is really the big driver in the, or of the urgency of this increased need for conservation. Our governor is encouraging people in hordes to move into Florida. Um, he's actually bribing companies to the tunes of millions of dollars to relocate to Florida and bring people with them. Uh, we have now 20, almost 21 million people in Florida, third most populous state. We added over 367,000 people in 2016. And this is after subtracting out migration and deaths. So this is the net growth. And we have over 100 million tourists annually. So on a daily basis, I can drive from my home to my former campus and see new habitat being destroyed on a daily basis. And it's extremely sad. Where are those people? Well, um, both historically and, and still now, they're distributed largely along the coasts, which as you recall, is, which is where we have a lot of our endemics. They're down the central spine of the state, another high endemic area. And they're in this, uh, pernicious Orlando to Tampa I-4 corridor, which is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We have an additional problem, a problem that has been identified as early as the 1950s in a journal article by the eminent ecologist Frank Egler, sea level rise. The effects of sea level rise have been documented in Florida since the 1950s. This isn't some hypothetical future scenario. It's happening now. And increasingly, we see the signs, not just on human communities and infrastructure, but on natural communities. And some colleagues and I did a study a few years ago. We found over 300 species in Florida are vulnerable to the combined impacts of land use change, especially increased urbanization and sea level rise. Basically, as my mentor Larry Harris said, they're caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. The devil being urbanization and the deep blue sea, which is rising. This is just a sampling of those species that are at risk. But away from the coast, we have small, isolated communities known from nowhere else on Earth, such as this G1S1 community, Florida Upland Glade. A very strange community. Floristically, it's most similar to the Blackland prairies of further north and west in the south. 
It, it doesn't yet have any described narrow endemic species exclusively found within it, but a couple are being described, but it has a lot of disjunct species that are way outside their normal range. An example is this one, uh, barren silky aster, which is, occurs further north um, across the southeast in calcareous grasslands, glades, and barrens. It, it is known from only two sites in Florida within one county, within these upland glades. Yet these glades are unprotected. Okay, this, um, this was the highest quality glade you see right here. Um, it's owned by a, a landowner who ha has an adjacent quarry, and even though he vowed to protect these sites voluntarily, um, after we saw this, uh, my colleague who knows him went to him and said, oh, just some of the boys joyriding in the bulldozers. So basically he destroyed most of the highest quality glade in just one afternoon. So I hate to say, voluntary conservation doesn't necessarily work. You've got to have a legal mechanism, at least a conservation easement, to protect these lands. And unfortunately, neither the state, the Nature Conservancy, or other land trusts are no longer interested in these small, isolated areas in Florida. They're all kind of jumped on the big landscape bandwagon. And there's another reason, of course, why we need areas both large and small, near and even inside urban areas. People need to have nature close at hand. And many talks here this year and every year have emphasized this. People need natural areas to maintain their sanity. I know to maintain what's left of my sanity, <laughs> I need places like Mills Creek, which I call my personal Walden because it's 1.4 miles from my house, which is the same distance that Walden Pond was from Henry David Thoreau's home in Concord, Massachusetts. And I go here regularly, and it helps. But there's also um, millions of acres, actually, in Florida of these very large ranches. Florida was the original cowboy state, and we still have a very active livestock industry. And these semi-natural landscapes are incredibly important. And it's, it's crucial that we keep these as working ranches rather than allowing them to be turned into cities. And what's happening now, the big theme in Florida is developers come in and they create these new cities out in the middle of nowhere. And just recently, a new city of half a million people was approved. Um, it's being put forward by the Mormon Church, which, or, which owns, um, it's the largest private landowner in Florida. And they plan to develop virtually all of their land. They're getting out of the cattle business, pretty much, going into urban development. But there are species, curiously, that actually prefer these semi-natural grasslands to our native grasslands, which seems odd. But these are species that are associated with more closely cropped short grasses, such as exotic bahia grass, Pespalum notatum, that the ranchers have planted. Um, examples here are shown here are the crested caracara, uh, the Florida burrowing owl. These are um, populations in Florida that are disjunct from the western United States and southward and northward in some cases. Um, the Florida sandhill crane also prefers these semi-natural uh, grasslands on ranches to our native grasslands. So again, we need these small natural areas protected, like Florida upland glades, as well as these large semi-natural landscapes. So to conclude, um, even in Florida, a state where we have accomplished so much for conservation, uh, we're starting to lose ground. Uh, significant gaps remain. We can't rest on our laurels. A lot of people say, oh, we've done a great job. You know, it's just a question now of management. Now, management is key, don't get me wrong. But if we want to prevent a huge wave of extinctions within the coming decades, we have to start acquiring more land and getting more conservation easements on private land to do it right. And I, please don't take this message as a bummer. Um, look at this as an opportunity. Our jobs are not done. We have so much more to do, not just in Florida, but in all the states and elsewhere where you all live. So we need to get going and continue the good work. Thanks very much. Well, I think uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to have each of our speakers come up and join us at the, the dais, and um, we'll entertain some questions. I have, um, just by way of sort of connecting the current session with last year's, um, I mentioned that that uh, much of the discussion last year focused on sort of the relative benefits of 
traditional preserves versus active traditional historic based historically based restoration versus uh, facilitating a call them novel ecosystems for the purposes of of sustaining some biodiversity of our choosing across the across the landscape I think each of our speakers kind of touched on various aspects of that but I I'm, I'm curious to know, thinking about the landscapes that each of you worked in or have worked on and, have, and, and are familiar with um, and what contributed to conservation in each of those cases, what, what in those cases, what was the relative contribution of each of those strategies? And, and thinking a little bit further, what, what would be the ideal if you, if you could design uh, integrated s landscape strategy, what would be the ideal set of strategies or allocation of strategies to your landscapes? Go ahead, Scott. Does this work? Can you hear me? Um, you know, I, I, I think of it, the, it very much as landscape specific. I don't think there's ever a perfect set. Um, we work uh, a lot with ranches and farms, um, and ranches and farms are both agriculture, but the, what we do with them is totally different. On farms, we're planting totally novel ecosystems. We're taking crops out that have sometimes been in for 80 years uh, on landscapes that have not seen a native plant, and we're putting a, a system of native plants back in that would have never lived in that arrangement. But there's no other way to do it on farms. These are often linear, uh, long hedgerows or uh, meadows, but, but they never exactly existed. And I'll give you an example. We're doing big projects in the Central Valley, seven mile long hedgerows. They're all native plants, they're all drought adapted. They all grow somewhere in the Central Valley. They would have never grown in a 40 foot wide strip seven miles long. Um, but they are serving wildlife in a big way. There's great data to show that beyond pollinators and other beneficial insects, as they age, birds, uh, rodents, all sorts of animals are using them. And it's totally different than Martin, where I've worked, where we want to, I think, get back to what should have been there with a thoughtful approach to climate change. So. I don't, it's hard to have some toolbox with that exact set of, of, of uh, uh, for every situation. Sure. Well, in, in Florida, I, I think, you know, we've, we've made too radical of a shift from the old school type of naturalized conservation. You know, kind of the, the George Fell to Bob Jenkins phase of nature conservancy conservation, for example, over to this working landscapes conservation paradigm. And, you know, they're both worthwhile and they serve different purposes. And as we can see from the Florida example, we have these endemic rich, endemic packed, you know, relatively usually small natural areas that are now kind of being abandoned and we've shifted over to this large landscape conservation, which, you know, I helped introduced the, the state of Florida, and again, I'm feeling a bit guilty, guilty about it. I think we need to get back to a healthy mix between the two approaches. I, I don't think I have a lot to add to that, um, but in the Laramie Foothills, we, we have that diversity of management uh, in place, and, and probably because of the scale, um, the size of the parcels, um, the stewardship that's happened on those places, we have um, really good to excellent condition on most of those lands. And so um, we, we've really endeavored to try to limit um, in terms of like very traditional preserves, recognizing that there are people's livelihoods at stake, but also recognizing that they have good management tools um, and restoration can play a significant role there. So I think in our situation, you know, you'll see all of those things in our landscape, but um, it's about the condition that exists and, and the existing stewardship and management and working from there to kind of figure out what that combination is. Good. Um, I just had one other little question that occurred to me in listening to all of your talks. Scott, you, you mentioned the importance of having a kind of a complex of sites to 
essentially spread the risk of potential loss to any given site. And Heather, you mentioned the importance of risk and taking risks in your landscape. I'm wondering whether, and, and Reed, even in, I think, kind of you were aiming at sort of a strategy of redundancy and the need to address potential loss. It, um, in each of your cases, uh, was there, was risk an explicit, uh, was risk spreading in explicitly incorporated into the strategy? And, and if not, um, you know, do you have any recommendations for how individuals in the audience can participate in kind of a risk spreading strategy? I mean, I work on a lot of rare endemic, some of them endangered, formally endangered, but all of them really at risk species. And I think our, we think about risk in every one of those. When you're down to three or four populations, you're really narrowing that risk pool. And as we found populations of Marden Skipper, we didn't want to just focus on the largest or the best. We really wanted to focus across the landscape and reconnect them wherever possible. Where we've worked on stoneflies in stream systems where a stonefly might be above an outflow, you know, you have populations above and below. You want to think of both of those populations because what happens where if uh, impoundment is put on, you know, that lower outflow and the populations below it are impacted. So in my view, I, I think of risk in, in all of our endangered species work. Um, in our general habitat work, often that's just opportunistic, and I think the more the better. Yeah. So I guess that's in, a, in some ways a, a form. I'm thinking of risk just not as uh, inherent, you know, it's just inherent. Because my, my goal is to have as many of these natural areas as, uh, as, as, as valuable as possible for biodiversity, whether they're large, whether they're incredible, like the, the Larimer Canyon, which I, I spent some time out there documenting the insects for, for Boris, uh, uh, or they're small and the woodlot where I grew up. I mean, they're all really important and we need to maximize the potential of all of them. Um, I think about risk the same way as Scott, but also a little differently too. Um, I think about when threats are high and your biodiversity is high and the impact on people is also high, um, you have to kind of judge, you know, um, what's the trade-off between action um, or limiting that action? And I think um, being very strategic about that, thinking carefully through it, um, and when you're asking people to um, perhaps try management strategies that are different, maybe a little untested, could have impacts on their livelihoods that are real and economic, that's when um, your risk becomes more personal. Um, and also you have to start to think about contingency planning. And I think we've, we haven't done that as well as we probably should and taking an experimental approach to um, management actions and conservation is really important in that moment and being very clear about it, that these are the risks, this is the approach we're gonna take. Um, our expectation is, is certain things will happen and if they don't, what are we gonna do and how are we gonna, um, do we wait to the end and then say oops or do we actually have a process that you go through that you're looking for indicators about whether you're heading in the right direction or not. Um, so that you can adapt um, your management and your actions and, and shift slightly to try to meet those outcomes. Um, so taking calculated risk is what I prefer to talk about um, with all of those factors in mind. In, in Florida, um, to my knowledge, risk has really not been considered explicitly by conservation planners, either in the state or the private sector. It's more a question of you know, if, if we don't protect these areas quickly, the, we have a risk of losing them completely to new development. So sure. that's been the main concern. But I think, um, again, implicitly, there's been an acknowledgement of the need for redundancy that you need. If you have these rare species, you, you don't protect them just one place. You need to have multiple sites. So that kind of spreads the risk of, of a loss of any particular population. Yeah. So it's been an implicit thing rather than a calculated thing, I think. 
Great. Um, just one last thing before we turn to the audience for, for questions. Um, you three have obviously been great leaders in, in conservation, and particularly in conservation at this larger scale. Um, but a lot of the people in the audience aren't really in a position or maybe haven't felt like they've been in a position to lead such efforts. Do you have any recommendations for, for individual preserve managers in terms of how they can contribute to large scale conservation in general? <laughs> Continue that trend. Um, uh, yes, I mean, I think the one, you do need to focus on your preserve and make it as biodiverse relevant as possible. You need to make this a place with your, whatever your goals are in mind, whether you're including recreation and other things, there are often things you can do to improve these landscapes, and you know that better than me. But I think where Xerces has really come in and where I think individual managers are, are a part of it and can be even more of a part of it is to look outside your preserve and figure out who else is working within that landscape. Is it, you know, it, it, could it be Colorado DOT where they're at right now looking at lands to change their mowing regime to increase biodiversity on roadways? Could it be a power line right of way that is adjacent? Could it be a school? Could it be a river corridor that's close enough that you can connect these landscapes up? So look at who else is in your sphere and don't just limit it to maybe other parks people, although they're important, or other natural areas people but maybe think outside the box and how you can make your natural area a hub for maybe even some smaller areas around it. I and then you're the big guy in the pool uh, bringing in those smaller habitats. Great. Um, I guess I would add to that two things. I would say um, find a mentor. Find somebody who's working in this area, who's done this, who's willing to share um, their knowledge and expertise and then provide you with support and feedback. Uh, for me, that was, that was critical. And then I would say, um, echoing what Scott said, is um, one of the first things we did is we took people from our community somewhere else to see people doing this in another place. They were with their peers in a different landscape who were facing even bigger challenges. And the point was, you know, other people are already doing this, and you can do it too. It might be slightly different, um, but if those people with really much more tough situations can do it, surely we can do it as well. And I think that that made us stop for a moment and really take, take carefully in, in, into our minds, you know, what the, what the opportunity was and what our responsibility was. I think one key point is um, anybody can make, any one of us can make a substantial, critical contribution to conservation. Uh, you know, don't wait for our political leaders, for our agency heads, for our organizational heads to come up with the ideas. Um, it's often lower level staff that come up with ideas. I mean, you take, take out of Leopold as an example. Uh, Leopold came up with some of his fundamental insights um, while he was, you know, working on horseback as a forester in the, on southwestern national forests. And, you know, in, in many other cases, it, was, it were students and lower level agency employees that came up with a lot of these plans that are now, you know, considered, um, you know, kind of stat, you know, the status quo for how we do conservation. So it's, it's up to everybody to be thinking about these things. And if an idea comes to you that seems like a good one, there's a pretty good chance it is a good idea. So go ahead and pursue it. And, and get some support for it and go with it. Great responses. Um, who's got the microphone out there? All right, Paula. Do we have any questions back here, out here in the audience? Yeah, well, we'll get you a microphone for you so, so we can get you recorded. Um, this is for Reed. Is it on? Yep. Okay. Um, I just uh, was really agreeing with your comments about 
few sites are narrow endemics missing the boat a lot of the time with big conservation efforts. And I have felt <coughs> in recent years, and I don't know if you've gotten this too, that TNC has sort of abandoned um, endangered species and the small sites. And I've seen it happen in a, <coughs> a few places. And there are so many of them. And it's uh, too much to expect TNC to be able to do all of that. Somebody told me 20 years ago, Cecil, we can't save all the species. And that's sort of an obvious thing. Do you have, have you given any thought to, you know, what's really happening with all of those sites? There's, you know, thousands of them. And wh what might be possible in the future? Like what approaches could we take? Thanks, Cecil. That's, a, that's really a, a topic I think about every day virtually. Um, as I mentioned in my talk, you know, the, uh, I have, I've been a Nature Conservancy member for decades, and a, a lot of the early work that um, I did was in collaboration with the, the Nature Conservancy, and same with Larry Harris, and I mentioned both the Ohio Edge of Appalachia system and the, the Pinnock Swamp, all those were TNC projects. Um, Today, I think you're absolutely right. Um, TNC has shifted away from protecting sites for rare species, um, with some important exceptions, and towards more of a working landscape model, which, again, my, one of my main points is that these should not be mutually exclusive. They're both important. But who is going to protect those small sites with rare species? And personally, I'm not willing to give up on, on any species. Um, I'm not willing to lose anything. I, I know that we will. But we, if we resign us, con consign ourselves to failure there, then we'll, we'll surely fail. Um, I'm, I agree with the Zero Extinction Alliance, or whatever they're being called now, that we should try to prevent all human-caused extinctions. Now, we know we won't succeed completely, but if we just say, oh, we'll just let half species go, no big deal, that's a real cop-out. So um, we need to get back to identifying these sites, and especially, you know, the old, the old approach of hotspots is very valuable, sites that are packed with rare species, especially endemic, but are also at risk of destruction. I mean, this kind of irreplaceability versus vulnerability um, framework has been used by, in, by many names, by many organizations from TNC to Conservation International to World Wildlife Fund, and yet I don't see it being used um, as much today. The whole hotspots thing has kind of fallen out of favor, even within Conservation International, which was the main group that, that um, really promoted that idea. But hotspots occur at all scales. They're not just global biodiversity hotspots. Every landscape has its hotspots. So recognizing those and protecting them while working with landowners to manage land properly across large landscapes are things that are com totally compatible and need to be pursued in tandem. Okay. I already have the microphone. Oh. Is this oh, thing really working? <laughs> cool. Hey awesome presentations, there were a couple of common themes that went through them all, and one of them was the amazing difficulties that you have had to surmount to uh, work at large landscape scales. Um, and, and, and it was very cool to kind of see, you know, from the small scale to the really big scale. Um, so what I'm interested in is, like, for example, I think, Reed, maybe you made this the most clear, but it was common to all of them, all of you guys, was you know, in Florida, I mean, really, I didn't know 30% of the state was under some level of relatively high protection. That's mind-blowing, okay? So for a lot of people in this audience, you put it real well. It's like, oh, wow, we're done there. Let's go elsewhere. So, and then, you know, the other case studies, too, made really clear that, you know, th that another issue is sort of political will and local support and what people know. So what I'm knowing, what I want to know is, given that you just gave great examples of amazing success stories, um, where do you go from here? How do you, what's the next gear and how do you get there? And is it, are you guys comfortable with the idea, uh, and some of this was, was implicit in some of what you said, are you comfortable with the idea of kind of getting into the ecosystem service business, stuff like that? I just like your take on how do you get from beyond the things that you've done thus far and that you see as successes to where, because you know and we know that it's not enough. So in this political age, in this economic age, uh, how do we get there? What, what, are, what are the linkages? How do you get to society? How do you change people's minds about expanding reserve networks that are already big enough? Well, I think 
to reach more broadly, um, we need to, as scientists, become better communicators. So that's number one. Uh, Alan Alda has a great new book out. Uh, Alan Alda started uh, doing documentaries with scientists and evidently early on found that these scientists couldn't communicate enough to even be in his documentaries. <laughs> so he started doing a series of workshops for scientists to help them communicate. And we do need to communicate better, whether it's ecosystem service, which I think is an important one um, that we should talk about, but it shouldn't be the only thing we talk about. And I think that some conservation organizations uh, and I do, we do work with Conservation International, but they went really from this biodiversity hotspot to this ecosystem service idea. And I think there's some credibility there, and ecosystem services are, are really important, and s some people grasp them. Um, but we need to look at where are the leverage points for people? What do they care about, and how do we bring them along? I work on invertebrates, um, and so, you know, our charismatic uh, animals are monarchs, um, but pollinators. Um, but we're, so we're starting a process project in urban areas with park managers and others where we're, we're talking monarchs and pollinators to bring in overall biodiversity. We're, we're kind of getting in the door with what people think we're coming in to talk about, and we're going to talk about water quality and pesticides and green lawns and the whole bit and and birds you know we're, we're not above talking about those vertebrates um, to bring us along but I think we need leverage points I think we need communication and we need to figure out how to communicate to new audiences um, especially young people and there are folks out there that can help us do that but we need to do that better um, I, I now am at Colorado State University at the Center for Collaborative Conservation and retired from the Nature Conservancy May last year. And I see the opportunity at, at the center um, all about building collaborative capacity. Um, I think the place in the future where this work is going to happen comes from the community and landscape scale upwards. <coughs> I think we have to build the capacity of those organizations and partnerships and collaboratives so that they're sustainable. So irrespective of changes in federal administration and budgeting and the trickle-down effect, that those organizations working together in the places that, that they know and love have the capacity to do that um, and to do that long term and to be effective at it. And part of that is building, you know, we've trained um, all of us very well. We're, we're highly competent technically. But very few of us are natural born leaders and facilitators and, as Scott says, communicators and negotiators. It's these other skills um, that we just expect people to just go out there into these human landscapes um, and, and be able to communicate and engage people and solve these issues in effective way and you're done. So I think we need to, and we have started this, to really train um, our natural resources and conservation practitioners and partners to a higher level in these collaboration skills so that they can be more effective in their conservation outcomes. Well, to me, I guess it's all about biophilia and natural history. By that I mean, um, I agree with Ed Wilson, E.O. Wilson, that you know, children are born with an inherent attraction and affiliation with living things, with nature. And they progressively lose that um, through their parents, through their teachers, through a society in general who tells them that that's not important. You know, my son, when he was, um, I think it was about third grade, the kids were going around, they, they were, the teacher asked them what they wanted to be when they grew up. My son said herpetologist, and she laughed and said, oh, you'll grow out of that. Mm. You know, so. We're, we're taught from the time we're young that that's not important. So gra gradually our natural, our biophilia doesn't completely disintegrate, but it's lost. But the key to preventing that from being lost, I think, is solid natural history education, which is it's starting to be an upswing now, again, uh, finally, uh, in this country at least. Um, nature study used to be a required um, part of the curriculum for public schools um, in the early, 20th, early and mid-20th century in the United States. Then it just totally disappeared. 
Um, environmental education was big in the 60s and 70s, but then it became more and more divorced from natural history. That was my original field, and I left it because there was very little natural history education left in it. But I'm seeing that, you know, through my own kids and kids that I, you know, have experience in knowing and leading on nature walks and stuff, that you can, you can keep people interested. And even some adults can be brought back <laughs> into the fold of biophilia with the exposure to nature and just how wonderful it is. Now, I will use myself uh, ecosystem service arguments at times. I mean, they're real. They really do exist. I mean, intact forests really do protect watersheds and so on. But it's a slippery slope because, um, you know, I, I am quite sure that you could lose, in many cases, half of your native species in a given biological community. And that community would provide ecosystem services just as well as it did before. We could have those natives replaced by exotics. We could have a massive waves of extinctions and we could still get ecosystem services. And I'm not willing to live with in that kind of world. So I emphasize the intrinsic value of each and every living thing. And I think that with natural history, you come to respect species as valuable in their, for their own sake and in their own right. Uh, but it takes, it takes work. It takes educators. It takes good communicators at all levels. Excellent. Dave. Very much. Um, the three of you are true conservation geniuses. I really hope I can grow up to be more like you somehow. <laughs> um, so, uh, hence my question. Um, I, I sort of listening to your inspirational talks and uh, sort of coming to think of the fence that you took down, Heather, as sort of a metaphor for um, you know taking down that fence wasn't you know it was keeping the cows out, but it was keeping your ideas in, and you almost like released this. Pandora's box of, of uh, you know, catalyzing change across this huge landscape when you did that is how it, it felt from your presentation. And, and I, th I think you touched on that, Scott, too, about that sort of um, transformation of, of how people are thinking. And so first you have to have really good ideas, which all three of you have. I don't know how that, I mean, that's the, your own unique genius, but then but all three of you have been so effective in taking those ideas out to a, a, a group of stakeholders that weren't even thinking about those. And so I'm kind of curious if there are some lessons you can impart to us and how you were so effective in getting those things to happen in, under these improbable circumstances that you've been successful. That's, I think, the hardest question we've had so far. <laughs> um, they're getting harder as we go along here. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, th I think the thing, again, is that um, ideas really do spring from uh, uh, being well-rounded and really thinking about not just my side of this, and, and I am, am in a brotherhood with Reed over... Uh, many, many of these issues, but we have to think about how these other people are thinking. They don't think like me. I can't go, I can go to you and say, yeah, let's do this, and you're like, sweet, let's do this. But I need to think about how do I talk to that farmer who has a bottom line to keep, who has done this this certain way for this many years, and, and it's by two things, it's getting out there and really thinking about what's important to them, but also getting out there and having the conversations back and forth and thinking about really going out. Um, and in the farm landscape, the best conversations happen around a tractor. <laughs> they really do. And if you get into farm work, if you get into farm conservation, make sure you know your tractors, make sure you know which ones are cool, um, and make sure that you can even help fix them from time to time. Um, but you, you know, but never you lose your sense. And I think that sometimes we do go a little far. I don't ever say, say anything that I don't truly believe. And sometimes I'll disagree when I'm out there talking to a large farmer, but I'll disagree respectfully. And we can have that conversation and see where we can meet. So I have no idea whether I really answered your question. But, but I do think that, you know, you need, to, you need to be thinking about how do we get them to move our way a bit? 
and how do how do you impart your why this is so important to them in some way and I think many people do come back and many people love nature um, and just a very quick story we worked with this farmer who at first was a little skeptical and UC Davis went out in the 1960s and 70s and had a head of the Ag Department that told people they needed to take out every natural area around their farm, everyone. They harbored diseases and pests. And so this guy's father had taken out acres and acres and acres of natural areas. But once we started talking about it and he started to grasp that the, this could be important to re in part, he actually took a step back and said, actually, I remember how sad my dad was when he mm -hmm. took this out. He said, this is where the hawks live. This is where the eagle comes. But that guy at UC Davis, he, you know, he's the scientist. I've got to do what he said. So, but that happened after a couple conversations where originally he wasn't going to do it. And in the end, he had some money. He's got 40,000 acres in the Central Valley. Mm -hmm. But he's put in about four miles of 50 foot to 80 foot long or wide hedgerows um, of willow and other flowering plants uh, that that was a conversation between us but I had to get to where to understand him and spend the time and I think that's where if sometimes we need to do things fast and sometimes it's so hard because stuff comes crashing down but where I think you said it well where we can work together we're, we're going to have this for a, a longer period I have no idea whether I answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, David, that's a, it's a hard question. <laughs> Thank you for asking it. Um, uh, there's a lot to say about this, but I would say um, uh, Rick and I were given really good advice when we first um, moved to um, that watershed. And we were told to, to shut up and listen, essentially, for five years or so. Um, and, and what that person meant by that was, you know, we all bring with us um, our own experiences, our own values, um, all kinds of things. And we often forget that when we arrive in a place, that we, that comes with us. And similarly, all those people in that place have that too. And so we have to remind ourselves that people are there because they love that place, right? They're connected to it. They find some meaning in it. Um, but we've become much more urbanized and we've lost some of those connections. So I think it's about being willing to be open to hear about each one of those people in that place and inviting them to know you and then finding what it is that you have in common. And there's going to be, you know, sometimes the gap is wide, but sometimes, surprisingly, it's actually not that far apart. And it's about really focusing on, we, we may have slightly different motivations and we might rank those things a little differently, but you know those ranchers in that community were there because for generations they loved that place and that's where they raised their children. People moving from town were going there because they were seeking a better place also to be and going back to nature and, and willing to drive and take their kids to town multiple times a week to play soccer and all those other things. And they, they love that place, but they were somewhat disconnected. So it's about um, spending the time to really understand that and to listen and to see their stories, hear what they've done in the past, and try to, try to fathom a way forward together where you can start in a common place. And as you build trust, then you can start to talk about the more difficult things. Um, but I would say learning to listen, um, drinking a lot of coffee, <laughs> um, learning to ride a horse in our, in our case, learning to fix fence, learning to get dirty, um, and to do more, I think is important. Well, as, as Scott and Heather emphasized more than I did, um, the importance of being able to communicate with an audience is, is key. And that means you have to know your audience and what's important to them. And that brings me back again to Aldo Leopold. Because a big part of Leopold's genius was being able to give the same general message to a diverse set of audiences, be they farmers, ranchers, hunters, scientists, politicians, uh, fellow members of the Wilderness Society, 
give the same underlying message, but in very different terms, very different specific arguments that he knew would be important to that particular audience. And he was a genius at doing that. I have personally never read anybody else who, who could do it so well. And if you read um, out of Leopold's biography by Rick and my good friend, Kurt Miney, uh, published in 1988, um, out of Leopold, his life and work, um, there's you know samples from his various speeches that he gave to these groups. And you'll see this remarkable ability to speak to those people on their own terms, but give the same message that how important conserving the land is for all of us. Do we have a distributed so, microphone at this point? Oh, there we thank go. Thank you. Good. There um, you. I, I just had a comment um, in response to a couple of folks that um, mentioned that the Nature Conservancy is moving away from the uh, large landscape protection. And I agree, and that's been a concern of mine too, just um, that shift. But I think we need to you know, think about the wise words of our panel here to really listen um, and where are they coming from? And I think it's, it's great that they're, they're really looking at these large landscapes. And here in Colorado, and I suspect it's also true in other places around the country, we have um, a lot of land, other land trusts that are w partnering with us to protect the smaller sites. Um, and there are coalitions of land trusts. There's the county government, the mu municipalities. Um, even our uh, Colorado Department of Transportation has been working with us on this um, sort of small site conservation. So I think it's really important to have, and I think that was certainly the comment that, and, and Reed's um, emphasis to, you know, we really have to be doing both to be thinking of, and, and the Nature Conservancy is well poised to be thinking about the larger landscapes and these other land trusts and other partners are, are you know, can help with some of the smaller sites, so. Great, we have 10 minutes left or so, so we can take a couple more here. But, uh. We're dominating in this sector here. <laughs> um, I, I, I did have a, a question, it, it kind of touched on the ecosystem services thing. So I worked for four years at, for a nonprofit in California. We were focused on doing restoration on private lands, so farmers and ranches. Mostly farms, though, where um, they didn't want to deal with agencies, and so we kind of came in, and the, the, a lot of this had to do in the, base, the San Joaquin River Basin, which has just been devastated. And we were looking at actually small tributaries to try to do restoration on the tributaries to get habitat back, but also to cool down the stream temperatures and, and, and get some groundwater back. Um, and originally, the, the landowners were, everyone complained, oh, it's all that red tape and that we need 12 different permits if we want to reshape the stream bank. And so it, it came out originally as an argument, oh, it's just too much bureaucracy. They don't want to do it. So I worked on this integrated permitting framework that actually dovetailed the federal, state, and local permitting that was, you could hand to a landowner on a silver platter, and we did, and it was crickets. And then what I really realized after spending years on this, and people had, before me had spent years on it, is there still, we were missing this incentive piece. So I started looking around in the toolbox and I found this ecosystem services thing and that still seemed like eons away from ever getting out of theoretical land to like really something that could turn revenue. So I guess my question to the panel is, and, and these are areas that you could actually get farm bill money out there to do buffers and so forth, but the NRCS and the resource conservation districts, those, were, those streams that we wanted to focus on were not necessarily in their priority areas, so they weren't freeing money up for that. So in, in a case like that, what, are, what could be an incentive to, get, to, to really get a landowner excited because, as, as you have observed, they're dealing with you know, profit margin issues and, and they're trying to raise crops. And this, this restoration stuff seems like a you know, boutique thing to them. Yeah, it's a, that's an interesting question. And you know, the NRCS is great. We did in, so in full disclosure, um, we have uh, 12 partner biologists with NRCS. So I, um, just in full disclosure. Um, 
And you know, this ecosystem service argument is, is great, but I do, again, think it only goes so far. And I'm gonna use pollinators as an example of that. So there are a lot of crops in California. We work, uh, sustainable conservation, is that who you worked for? Yeah, yeah I knew that. Um, good, good organization. Um, who we've partnered with in the past. So we do a lot of work in the Central Valley, and uh, we work with farmers on mostly the issue of pollinators. And the ecosystem service are, uh, you know, that's some one that's really concrete. You've got a crop, it flowers, it needs a bee to pollinate it, and there's really good data that if you put habitat out there, you can bring in native bees and either partially or fully um, pollinate. Um, but it's still cheaper to buy honeybees, to, bring, mm. to rent honeybees. At this point, it is still cheaper. So you have to get those farmers to make that leap, which we've used the issue of food security, of farm security, that honeybee prices have gone from $50 a hive to $400 a hive. It's still cheaper than putting in a bunch of habitat, mm -hmm. but it's going up and they may not have honeybees down, you know, in, in the future. But we're also looking at the whole cadre of farm bill programs as well. So we're trying to maximize these services. We go to a farmer and talk about pollination, talk about predators and pest control, talk about water quality, talk about wa other wildlife issues, and then talk about the financial incentives that NRCS does have. Um, and it is that longer term thing. NRCS is pretty open to working, but you have to, it, it's like that giant aircraft carrier. Um, they're moving and you can't go to them in one year and say, we would like to focus on this area. Um, and I know this, I've, we've been working in California to try to get them to have an initiative on uh, monarchs for several years and it seems like now, and that's a potentially listed species, and I'm going down next week uh, to meet with um, the technical advisory board for NRCS to, to talk about that and hopefully get that. But you have to, it's that slow process. So I think it's looking at as many things as possible. If you can stack ecosystem services along with quality of life issues, along with some incentives from the federal government to throw in, um, that's when we tend to get more adoption. And we're getting a lot of adoption in, in the Central Valley. Um, uh, is it enough? Well, we'll see, but, but there's a lot of people interested, so. Um, here on the Colorado Front Range, we have a couple of different efforts um, in payments for ecosystem services, um, water funds, and essentially looking at um, fire risk reduction and forest health um, improvement with fire and other treatments to maintain or improve water quality and quantity. And so the several efforts underway at, at different kind of scales and different levels, um, and these are mostly um, voluntary um, situations rather than regulatory. We also have some efforts on nitrogen, nitrogen and phosphorus in the lower watersheds uh, related to Clean Water Act, and those are more um, regulatory driven. Um, but I would say, um, interestingly, um, the question about ecosystem services came out of our ranching community. Um, we were looking at um, what other ways can we incentivize and raise the bar on um, practices on land stewardship and restoration, um, and at the same time recognize the true cost to be a good steward and to deliver um, good stewardship on the ground that then you know, improves or guarantees those ecosystem services. Um, and so you know, for, for most of the ranching community, their economic margin is narrow. The work that they do is, is really critical in maintaining those grasslands and wetland systems and so on. And so if we can kind of agree upon the best practices, really look at the economic value of those and connect our urban communities downstream to recognize what it really takes to be a good steward. And then um, through water funds and payments for ecosystem services, then really recognize that cost and bring in new funding streams to support that level of stewardship. I think there's a real role there. Um, 
the one thing that we really talked about very early on as we thought about this new tool was um, uh, there's this perhaps an ethical question here about placing a dollar value on nature. And, and that's kind of tricky. Um, and we're still really struggling with how to do that in, in you know, scientific ways and economic ways that make sense. But it's also kind of an ethical question for us as well as communities. But I do see there's a, um, it's a potential tool that could really have a lasting effect, especially for um, landowners who have done conservation easements. The next generation isn't going to benefit financially. They'll have the responsibility to do that. So raising the bar of their, their improvement of the condition of that property and that landscape and recognizing the cost of that is potentially an important tool going forward. Not being a big proponent of ecosystem services, I don't think I have anything to add on this <laughs> issue. <laughs> well, you're, do you have, okay, good, then perfect timing. Because um, we are out of time. I don't want to stop this conversation, but I know people have appointments to get to. Um, I want to thank our guests. I especially want to thank Paula Fornwald and Lisa Smith there in the back, not just for their great microphone work, but for having the inspiration to invite this fantastic panel. And uh, let's give them all a round of applause.